Welcome to Life on the Rock. We have a great show for you tonight. We have Tim Chambers and Katie Hayek. They are from the movie The Mighty Max. Uh, Tim is the writer, the director, producer. Katie uh, is one of the, the actresses in the movie, and it's a very inspirational movie, a true life story about a basketball team in the early 70s that won uh, several championships. So they're going to talk about the, the film and some of the info behind the film. It's coming out on DVD, so we want to promote it. It's a good Catholic uh, movie. Good to see you, Doug. You too, Father. And is that you dancing on that open? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's one little quick snippet of me and my daughter yeah. dancing World okay. Youth Day. Yeah, just a little, hey. Yeah. Yeah. They're always uh, changing that up on us. Yeah. It's always interesting. Now, yeah. we have Pentecost coming uh, this Sunday. Yeah. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Preach your brother. We will receive power from on <laughs> high to be God's witnesses. Yeah. Right? So yeah. we don't have to be afraid of that big, bad world, right? And we're supposed to take the gospel to all parts of society, all parts of our culture. That's what our guests have done tonight, right? In the media world, they've made a film with uh, good family values and morals. Mm. So uh, we shouldn't shy away. We're empowered by God's grace and by His Spirit. Um, they well, should be the one afraid, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Look out, world. That's a great point, you know, because they, they were all hiding in that upper room. Right. You know, and it, it's, it's just a great, you know, thing to consider, meditate on is they're hiding in the upper room until this moment happens. And when this happens, the doors burst open and they're out and they're literally engaging the culture. Right. They're going mm -hmm. out and they're engaging the culture mm -hmm. and they do it fearlessly to the uh, point that uh, 11 of the 12 end up martyrs. Right. You know, and, I, this and they year, tried to kill John, but they couldn't. Right. Stuck him on an island. Right. And you know, this year in reading some of the texts of preaching on it, I realized you know, what, what, how big a change it is. You know, Peter is all of a sudden giving these great speeches yeah. and acts. And, when before uh, he was regularly putting his foot in his mouth. Right, right. And, in, and in one way or another. called <laughs> Satan by Jesus yeah. himself. And so Holy Spirit is powerful. He does great things. And, and one area we need to bear witness to in this culture is the sanctity of marriage. You know, that's been uh, talked a lot about in the news recently with uh, the president's statement. And I went to uh, the USCCB website, the conference of... Uh, Catholic bishops here in America, and they have some wonderful resources. You know, you might get questioned at work or in school about why the Catholic Church teaches, teaches what she does. And, you know, I think my, the way I approach it oftentimes is that at the heart of the argument, why we're saying that you cannot have same-sex marriage is because it's not equivalent to heterosexual traditional marriage. They are not the same reality. Uh, marriage brings together man and a woman uh, in a lifelong commitment of love, you know, for the purpose of uh, procreation and the union of the spouses. Now that union that they form is rooted in the sexual difference. That the, all the differences is more than just bodily, right? There's mm -hmm. spiritual, there's psychological, there's physical differences. Those differences allow for this unique union that we cannot just simply redefine without consequences for our society, right. right? Because I know, Doug, you talk a lot about this, the importance of family, and it's the basis of civilization. It's the basis of culture of, you know, of a human society. Right. Right. So we need to protect it. And if we make you know, other, other realities equal to it, um, this, this letter from the, the bishop said, when marriage is redefined so as to make other rela relationships equivalent to it, the institution of marriage is devalued and further weakened. The weakening of this basic institution at all levels and by various forces has already exacted too high a social cost. So it talks about you know, marriage you know, and family is the foundation, you know, marriage of course is the foundation of family which has this great public significance for society. You know, marriage forms a, a loving, a stable relationship of a mother and father to be present to raise the child. You know, it brings and joins mm -hmm. the two together. 
And then also our laws form young minds, right? If we say a certain behavior is immoral and yet enshrine that behavior in our laws, what are we teaching our young people? Right. right. So right. relativism. Relativism. You know, to yeah. a large degree, yeah. It's a it's a, it's an erosion. Right. Yeah. So we need to defend this. The church calls us to defend this uh, traditional understanding of marriage. And it's not about hate, um, you know, that we're instructed as Christians that obviously when the gospel teaches we have love for all peoples. And we don't reduce people to just their sexual orientation or attraction, right? They're a human person. They're worthy of love. Everyone, every human person is worthy of love. That's the way we treat all people. And the, must, and the catechism teaches the homosexual person must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. And, and help them in their vocation and their, in their life. So um, we need God's gift. We need his strength to bear witness in this culture. And, and um, do you have anything to add to that? Well, just, just, you know, for those of us who are, who are, you know, in families, you know, raising our kids, I mean, these are issues that are getting a little, little stickier to deal with, you know, especially the age of your children. And it's coming up more and more in the media. It's coming up more and more in the news. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's in your face more. And we've got to be clever as parents in how we're addressing it with our kids. But we do have to address it age appropriate and help them understand that this is something that's in our times now that, that's on this level and growing. And uh, in the, the battle to understand truth and not deviate from the truth is, is upon us. And we've got, to be, uh, we've got to be praying about this. We've got to be close to God in the sacraments. And we've got to be active in making sure that our kids are understanding what the truth is and not just kind of letting it sit to the side because someone's teaching them. And, you know, they're going to learn right, something. Right. And we've got to be, as the parents, we've got to be the ones that are the primary educators. Okay, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with Tim Chambers and Katie Hayek uh, talking about Mighty Max. So don't go away. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight we're speaking about the movie, The Mighty Max. It's out on DVD, and we've brought in the writer, producer, director, Tim Chambers, and one of the stars, uh, Katie Hake. Welcome. Thank you. Thank it's you for It's always excited to have a bit of Hollywood here, and uh, <laughs> I'm a sucker for Hollywood. Uh, I love the whole movie genre. <clears throat> it is so powerful. Let's first, uh, Let's talk about the historical moment of the film. Mm -hmm. Can you set that up for us? What is the film? Well, the, the, the story of the Mighty Max is based on a true story uh, about the 1972 Immaculata College girls basketball team. And they won the first national championship in women's basketball. And so, you know, if you think about that time period, in a lot of ways, there was a lot of transitions going on socially uh, with women and, and their, their own empowerment. And uh, this story really captures that and, and reflects on, uh, you know, most people look at head coach Kathy Rush as the godmother of not only women's athletics and Title IX, but women's basketball as well, because they were the first uh, dynasty in women's sports, a lot like, uh, you know, a Duke basketball is today or, uh, right. um, you know, one of the bigger powerhouses. Now, she coached at Immaculata College, which is where? It's uh, located in suburban Philadelphia, mm -hmm. about uh, 40 miles west of, uh, of downtown Philly. And she coached from 72 to 70? 70 72 to 77, seven. I believe it was, and uh, won three national championships national. during that time. And then Title IX came in in roughly the later 70s? Le uh, 78, I believe 78. it was, yeah. Okay. And what was the enrollment of Immaculata at that time, you think? I think so. there were about 450 students um, so and, you know, they played in tunics. It's the last time that a, a college girls college basketball team played in the, in the tunics with the sash. Not, not much different than the... Than Maybe the Katie could that. describe that for us. What was, you all went to, I mean, Tim and I went to great effort to make it very accurate. You're a modern basketball player, literally. What did you think of, uh, <laughs> of that uh, well, uniform? Well, the, the modern-day uniforms are certainly still kind of heavy and... and mm -hmm. 
you, you have all your gear that you're wearing. We had knee pads in college, so, so we would be more willing to dive on the floor for stuff. So, so we were so padded up, so wearing a dress was kind of very, just like you're floating around, <laughs> almost like playing basketball and Chuck Taylors to run around in. So it was, it was different, but I had fun in them. It was like literally a wool dress with a sash and a, like a white and blouse. And a button up short sleeve blouse. blouse Let, yeah. Let's talk about your background, Katie. You, you played at the University of Miami. Mm -hmm. And uh, what position did you play and how long did you play there? I was a shooting guard. I played there all four years, uh, started my senior year. Uh, and then I graduated and I, I found out about this audition and, and I was about to move to Hollywood and, and try and pursue my, my dreams there and uh, I found out about this audition and the rest is history. Right. So you studied theater in college. I did. Right. And how did you hear about the audition? I, I really think it was, it was local it was papers. Lo yeah. It was, um, yeah. We had uh, open casting calls in Los Angeles and New York and Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, it, it was interesting for, for us, and if you've seen the movie, you know that the level of play had to be so accurate, and you really had to buy into the talent level of the girls to ever believe in their journey. You know, because it really is an inspiring sports film for young girls, although, you know, fathers that have daughters that play sports love it as well, as do, you know, it's a great date movie, and um, so it really, it really kind of uh, appealed to different audiences, but, especially women's sports, uh, how much they gravitated and how much they responded to um, the journey of them really being the pioneers. Right. Now the other big moment uh, for the college at this point was they're on the verge of bankruptcy. Right? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you think about the early 70s, there was a time where, you know, an all-women's college was looking to merge mm -hmm. with, uh, because you didn't have co-ed like you do today. And, uh, I believe at the same time Notre Dame was merging with St. Mary's and other schools were starting to merge. And so this was one of those schools that had to consider that because of their financial situation and trying to survive. And when they won the national championship, it really put them on the map. And uh, you know, as they say, the rest is history. I mean, it's really one of the things that they're known for. Even now, this is the 40th anniversary of that championship season. In the NCAA, when they talk about you know, who started it all, you know, the, the, the more, when they talk about March Madness, they'll go back to the original days of the Mighty Max and interview Kathy Rush and the players on that team. Now, Katie, you played eight or ten years ago, still, you know, very modern uh, circumstance. What was your impression of what they did, this small Catholic college, uh, with the resources they had, and from your perspective? Well, playing, um, I graduated in 2006, so that was very modern day, and. Mm -hmm. and I was so lucky to just learn that whole story and where it really started and, and seeing where they came from and how much growth uh, women's basketball has has had since then. So I was fortunate to be on both ends of, of the stick and, and see where it came from and then see where I was and, and I was just lucky to, you know, get a feel for the 72 team. Because you were playing, University of Miami, you were playing the biggest schools, right? The biggest women's college basketball scene. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, Duke, so. UNC, UConn. Yeah, I was. I played in two conferences because at the yeah. time Miami switched from the Big East to the ACC. So I went to a bunch of different schools, mm -hmm. played there, and and got to experience that. Okay, well, we're going to show the trailer uh, to the Mighty Max. So I hope you enjoy this. In 1971, Kathy Rush was a woman ahead of her time. I only knew a few things about the college. It was all girls. Their basketball team wasn't very good. And the school was founded and run by the nuns. We're going after the team, right? Why? So we can continue to get crushed by all the bigger schools? We're in. Are you suggesting that our girls will become athletes? If they want to win, yes. I'll be satisfied if you just use these activities to suppress their hormones. She already has a husband. Why would she want to work? We know she's married to you, right? Ed Rush, the NBA rep. She had the faith to dream big. Girls' locker room? Right through there, door marked ladies' room. And the passion to change lives. One, One two, three, team. Fight for it. This is so unladylike. But when the odds were stacked against her... Your entire team broke curfew last night. She got a little help from some new friends. Watch the pick and roll! C 
see your man and the ball. Find him and box out. B I C T O R Y. Carla DiGino, David Boreanaz, and Academy Award winner Ellen Burstyn, based on a true story where sometimes. For every team that thought they never had a chance. When you believe in a dream. That dreams are only for rich kids. Our dreams are for everybody. But you have to believe it. Miracles happen. The Mighty Max. Don't you get hot in these things? It ain't easy, sister. I, I love the casting in the film. You really nailed it, especially the Sister Sunday. Is that Sister her name? Sunday yeah. and Marley Shelton. And of course, Ellen Burstyn. Uh, Burstyn was a Academy Award-winning actress, right. right? Yeah, you know, it was important for us. I, you know, in in kind of putting the film together, uh, that we wanted recognizable names and we wanted mainstream names. And uh, you know, getting someone like Ellen Burstyn, who's an Academy Award-winning actress, mm -hmm. or Carla Gugino, that's been in Spy Kids and uh, Night at the Museum, and Marley Shelton, who had her own TV series on uh, CBS called The Eleventh Hour, and David Boreanaz, who has his own show, Bones. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we really wanted to cross over into, you know, kind of uh, mainstream America to say that, you know, it's okay to have a G-rated film that appeals to, you know, kind of a family value uh, environment, but also, uh, you know, get recognition from, you know, Hollywood community. I mean, we had, we were the New York Times Critics Pick of the Week. We got thumbs up from Roger Ebert. Uh, we got a great review from Variety saying that, uh, quite frankly, they just don't make movies like this anymore. Right. And, um, and so it was very refreshing for us. We wanted that recognition. Um, and we've been out, you know, kind of evangelizing the film for the past, uh, you know, 12 months. And you were pressured, right, to make a PG film, right? The yeah, I mean, it was, we really had some, some uh, good debates um, or arguments, I can't really tell you which, but uh, about changing some of the scenes to get that PG rating. And we, we fought really hard to maintain, um, I mean, even some of the animated films that are, that are made now are not G, they're, they're PG films. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a stigma associated with you know, that this is too wholesome or it's G-rated and certain people won't go. And, uh, you know, we think the audience is out there for it. And we, I know it now, now that the DVD's out, um, where we get emails from schools throughout the country saying it's so nice not to have parental consent to show a movie in the classroom. And um, that's really what we wanted. You know, we want to get the word out and, uh, and we have. Because you, by, by having this emphasis on the quality of the movie, Right, you hope to penetrate a market that we might not reach, that aren't maybe in church on Sundays or tuning into EWTN. And uh, can you talk more about that, the kind of resistance maybe? Was there resistance to making a movie like yeah, this? Yeah, look, you know, I went to Catholic school for 12 years. I'm one of 12 kids. I have eight brothers and three sisters. So, you know, I I've lived it. And, you know, some of the resistance when we went out to first shop the project, you know, it, I thought it was fair criticism. You know, that they were saying that, look, it's going to be tough because Catholics don't mobilize. They don't really support the same agendas. And they certainly don't support uh, certain, you know, forms of entertainment right. in a way where they can rally around it. And you were told that by, right, one of yeah, the one higher... big agents in, in L.A., yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. they, they're kind of challenging us Catholics, right? To, I think they are. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, it was a challenge that, that, uh, that we wanted to take on, and we did. Um, and so now the challenge is, you know, will they, will they watch it on DVD or watch it when it comes out on cable right, or, or right. on TV? Let's talk about the role of the sisters in the film. I, I think you can obviously see your Philly parochial school right. education background because I really think you, you really captured something of the spirit there of the sisters and, and the way, uh, just their mannerisms, the way they mm -hmm. held, held themselves. Um, you know, I, I was looking at one of the early pictures of the original team, and it seemed like there's something special about them uh, just in the photo. And I couldn't help but thinking how they were supported by the sisters. The sisters were literally right, sure. standing behind them. Can you talk about that, their relationship with the sisters? Well, I, I think there's two things. One, as the screenwriter, 
I had given the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary final approval on the script. And, you know, I was a product of their teaching, so it wasn't a huge risk for me. And I always felt that I would write something that they felt comfortable with or my own mother would feel comfortable with. And so it started with that. And then, you know, I think the irony in the story is the fact that this organization, this, this, these sisters had such an impact and, and change and empowerment of these women in the early 70s. In a way, you know, I, I say this, that, you know, one of my favorite scenes is really the end of the movie when you see what all of these young women went on to do. And you talk about the immortality of influence and how a coach not only changed the team, but a campus and a generation of young women. Mm -hmm. And these sisters fully supported these young women and knew that change was upon them in a way that empowered them to go on to be coaches and teachers and doctors and, uh, and you know, um, many other things that, that school teachers. Um, and family and, women. And, 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 and well, Mothers Kathy Rush and, retired yeah. after six years uh, to raise her, her own yeah. family. She had her children during those coaching little, years. Yeah, there was a little yeah. overlap there of, yeah. of uh, you know, starting her family while mm -hmm. she was coaching and then made the commitment to her husband that she, uh, that she would stop, and she did. Wow. You know, which is almost unheard of, right. uh, you know, if a coach right. steps down that quickly after right. having that much success early on. Right. And you told me something interesting about how some of the players come back to visit the elderly nuns at the school today. Well, that's uh, true. Yeah. The, 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 uh, um, there's there's a, an area uh, adjacent to the campus called Camilla Hall, which is where the nuns, it's actually their retirement community. And many of the players still go there and volunteer and right. stay connected to... Right the sisters that were so influential in, in their own lives. And, um, you know, it was great for us as we shot the movie. Uh, there's cameos of the sisters that were part of the original championship in 72, mm. actually make a cameo in the movie. The original team, uh, the, the, the original Mighty Max, mm -hmm. they get dressed as nuns for the movie itself. Um, Kathy Rush plays a bank teller. The real Ed Rush plays, uh, you know, one of the supporters. So we, you know, when you're one of 12 kids, you're all about inclusion, right? So we. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, had as, we had as much inclusion as possible uh, with everybody that made this such an historic event and why it's recognized as really one of the, the greatest teams. Uh, and truly, the Cinderella story right. of all sports. Right. I just, I love that theme, too, of like the, these nuns supporting them, certainly with their prayers. You know, a lot was riding on it, sure. the, the, the success of this team. But also that these sisters took women seriously. I mean, sometimes the, mm -hmm. the, the Catholics are... Uh, you know, are accused of holding women back in some way or not having all the, you know, these crazy abortion rights or whatever right. today. Uh, but these nuns took these women seriously and told them to go for it. And, uh, oh, they did. And, 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 and that's what I think what, what makes the story unique, what makes Immaculata so unique, and what makes their religious order so, you okay. know, unique. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in a minute uh, with the Writer, producer, director of The Mighty Max, and one of the actresses, Katie Haig, will be back in a minute. back to Life on the Rock. Uh, Katie, I wanted to ask you about meeting Kathy Rush. You're a basketball player, you know the game. What impressed you about her in those meetings you had? Just the legend that, that and the tone that she's set for women's basketball, something that's so close to me. I've played basketball my whole life. So, so and, you could see the coach in her easy. Yeah, you know, yeah. of course. And, mm -hmm. It was definitely a bit nerve-wracking meeting her at first. She had so much history to her and with, so, with something like basketball. So um, it was funny, we had, a, we had a trip together to go promote the movie down at Duke University and she was asking me how old I was and when I was telling her, she was like, it's just amazing that when I was your age, I had three national championships, 
two <laughs> kids and married <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> and I had none of that. <laughs> so, um, I mean, she, she's just a great, great person. And mm -hmm. getting to know her and um, just being on set a lot yeah. of times with us, it was just really cool to be able to meet her and get to know her. What would she tell you, Tim, about the movie in terms of what she hoped for and what... Well, I, you know, I'll go back to that theme of inclusion, you know, that uh, I had a, extremely involved from the beginning. I had an open set, so all of the original players were allowed to visit the set whenever they wanted to, Kathy, Ed. Um, and so for us, it was really about capturing the authenticity of that moment in time and really how, at the end of the day, it really had nothing to do with sport. It really, you know, sports was nothing more than a metaphor of, you know, all things are possible to those that believe. I mean, that's really what it came down to and the impact that she had on these young girls. And um, she's just a natural born leader and um, she's got a great swagger about her, a sense of style. I mean, she was really kind of the whole package. Right. Um, you know, very smart and, um, and I think that's why she became such a great coach and, and leader. Um, and so I, I, I loved it. And I remember watching the final scene as we were shooting the final scene of the championship game, her and Ed were watching uh, next to us and they started to cry mm. because they knew that they, you know, they said that when you're living the moment, you can't really enjoy the moment. And so for them to kind of recapture uh, the essence of that journey and that championship was really special. Right. What was it, well first, how did you get Ellen Bernstein to uh, play, play the part? <laughs> uh, it, was a great, it was a great lesson for me. Uh, I was very fortunate to get hooked up with Creative Artists Agency in LA um, through one of their agents there, Mike Nylon, who read the script, he was from Philadelphia, he knew a little bit about the story. And so he, he sent it to Ellen and, and uh, she read the script and she really liked it and I was a first time director. She's an Academy Award winning actress so the message to me was, you know, uh, she'll meet with you in a couple days at her home. You can only stay for an hour. So of course I was nervous and I said, all right, I got to do a little more research on her character so that we can really dive into it. And then after about an hour, I said to myself, wow, this is really selfish. All I care about is me and the character. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I got to find out more about her. And so ironically, she had just written uh, her autobiography and I went and bought it that night and I had two days to read it and I did. And so by the time I met with her, um, after about an hour, we never talked about the script. I knew all about her, her life and what she had gone through. She invited me for dinner. I ended up staying there for about five hours and uh, she called me the next day and she said, I'm in. Is that intimidating so, to direct a character? I mean, an actor like that? Um, I, I wasn't intimidated because I felt very comfortable in the, you know, knowing the story as, as much as I did. Yeah. Um, but there's times where you catch yourself going, I tell him Burston. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's amazing, Yeah. right? But you have to, you know, uh, kind of, you know, there's a little give and take when you're the director and, and the actress and- She plays uh, the mother superior, we should say. Right. And, uh, now, did any of that cross your mind when you came to Life on the Rock that, wow, that's, that's Doug. Father Mark and Doug Berry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna be on the set with these. I mean, did that come to your mind at all? I, that's why we asked for a glass of water. We that's were so nervous. <laughs> so part. I'm just curious. <laughs> I, yeah, I figured, you know. <laughs> but you were affected by her, uh, Katie, weren't you? You were impressed by her? Yeah, oh, I, I mean, an actress that you look up to, just even some smaller roles, like I mentioned when she was in a Law & Order episode, that affected me so much because her talent comes out in that episode so much. But then, her, like we were talking about, her whole body of work, it just, it's so extensive and it's so good. And an Oscar winner in, in my first big feature film, to have that alone was mm -hmm. was a gift in itself. So And you talked about the mechanics of how she was actually played one scene, you just watched her, how she would make little changes and Yeah, you know. I had I had finished up my scenes and Tim was moving on to one of her scenes and I just started standing behind Tim and, and I was watching the screen as we were watching Ellen and she had a different take for every single every single thing she did she just did something different just to give Tim all these different oh. options as oh, as see. a director and I was just watching there and, and just soaking it all in like yeah, a sponge because yeah. you know she's the consummate actress to learn from so did you want to say anything about this next clip we're going to show um, with your character and wrestling with whether to continue with the team yeah she wrestled mm -hmm. with with the fact that she, she wanted to support um, 
her, her mom and her brother and, and she saw that she might have needed to take on a job and it was contemplating whether or not to stay on the team or to do that and this is where you see her talk to the coach. Okay, so we're gonna roll again a clip from the Mighty Max. What can I do for you, Trish? I got a job at a department store and they need me there three days a week. Oh, we're gonna miss you. Can I do both? And yeah, not in our program. Is that job something you've always dreamed of? No, not really. But employees do get 50% discount. I can only tell you this. Have the courage to follow your dreams. That's your gift to the world. Maybe it's working in a department store, I don't know. But if you give that gift, I promise a day will come when the world returns the favor. I thought dreams were only for rich kids. Now dreams are for everybody. All you need is a heart. You have the gift to play this game, Trish Sharkey. There is no doubt in my mind. But you have to believe it. You let me know what you decide, all right? That's Katie playing. Uh, the real character's name is uh, Teresa Shank Grant. And you got to meet Teresa. What was that like? We call ourselves peanut butter and jelly. We've been <laughs> on so many interviews together, yeah. and and we just have this this bond that I don't have with anybody else because really? basketball and acting is so close to me, and it's not often as an actress that you get to play a real life character. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of times you're just playing this character that that a writer has written for mm -hmm. you. So um, I was so lucky to have that to base a lot of, not necessarily my acting off of, but just this whole experience of, right. of the Immaculata story and the Mighty Max. And she came from kind of a, she, her, her, her home had burned down. Her house the, burned down. Her house burned down. Yeah. And, and that, that impressed you about, didn't you were mentioned to me earlier about the, the poverty in a sense, we could say, of the team compared to modern day athletics. <laughs> Can you talk about that element of it? Yeah, yeah, like I said, I just, I, I w was lucky to have this experience because at my school and, and Division One colleges all around the country, you, you're getting all your team gear and sneakers and some schools have chartered planes and just for their travel and everything that comes along with, with a scholarship. They didn't mm. have scholarships. I, I got a full full ride to Miami. So you have this to, to reflect on in, in the Mighty Max story and it just humbles you immediately because you realize how good you had it in college. Right. What was your general impression of the, of the players? You met just about all of them, right? Uh, or many of them. Um, what was your impression? Well, I remember we were on set and Tim, called out to us and, and had one of the PAs come over and say that the, the team was here and I was <laughs> immediately nervous because like I said I, I never played a, an, a real life person mm -hmm. and so I felt like I needed to to show myself for, for to Teresa and she was nothing but gracious and, and willing to tell me all of her stories and after I, I initially met her it was nothing but good things from that point on because it was just a learning experience for all of us as a team. Because your character went on to be a very successful coach mm -hmm. in women's basketball and several colleges and things. Yeah. And now you had a lot of cooks there cooking that stew, didn't you? <laughs> you had a lot of input, right? You had the, all these people that were really there in the event. What was, how did you balance all that? with an open set, you know? You know, it, 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 I think it really made it uh, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, just having the people that lived that moment uh, come back and relive that moment. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things we did with, with uh, the girls that played the Mighty Max is we had them live in the same dormitories mm -hmm. that the original team did. So it was interesting for them to come back. You know, they're now living in apartments and they've got flat sc screens and, um, so now we, we put them in a dorm with no, I don't think there was any air conditioning, right? No. Um, they had, 
you know, little black and white TV, which was a stretch, <laughs> and, you know, an ironing board. And, mm -hmm. uh, but you the know. thing is, we wouldn't have had it any other way because right. for as a team, you want to do the, that original team justice. Right. And we bonded immediately because when we met them, we saw how close they were to this day. And I now am so close with the girls that right. I, I played um, mm -hmm. for, the, for the Max team today. So we wanted to do that that sort of, and we woke up together, had breakfast together, would go to basketball stayed practice, together. stayed up late together, <laughs> shared lots of stories, right. <laughs> went to set together. Mm -hmm. So it was such a great, great experience. And I was yeah. very lucky. Let's talk a little bit um, about some of the factors that made this a great team. You mentioned one I never would have thought of, but the role that Cardinal Doherty had in Philadelphia. Yeah, you know, uh, Philadelphia, even, even today, when you look at some of the great college or professional women's and men's basketball coaches, you'll see that their roots go back to Philadelphia. And a lot of that has to do with Cardinal Doherty, who was so um, supportive of women's young, um, CYO sports, young boys and young girls, in the early 1900s. And so I think that's why Philadelphia was such a hotbed of women's basketball talent in the late 60s, and early 70s. Uh, most of the girls on this championship team went to uh, Catholic high schools. In Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think they're uh, from maybe a 30 or 40 mile, uh, 40 mile radius. Uh, you know, Cardinal O'Hara and uh, Villa Maria and uh, Archbishop Prendergast. So those schools really made up the core um, team for the Mighty Max. And so it was important, you know, because it's like, like most sports, if you have great feeder system right. and you're fostering kind of that, that teamwork and that talent at a very young level, you can see the benefits later on. And this was, right. you know, exhibit A for, for their growth. I know I, I got on YouTube and you can watch some of the video of the original games and, uh, and I was impressed by their play. I mean, they're like yeah. making shots yeah. from pretty far out and everything. Oh, sure. and it was a serious basketball yeah. team. I mean, yeah. Teresa Grantz uh, arguably was, you know, they compared her to Bill Walton mm -hmm. at the time that she was the female Bill Walton of that era. She was the national player of the year uh, a few times. Mary Ann Stanley, who was the point guard, uh, also, you know, right. uh, just a, a legend. Uh, so they were really, really talented. And we tried to capture that in the movie. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back uh, with the Mighty Max. So don't go away. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to Life on the Rock. And Doug, you got a question for well, us. Well, yeah, I mean, um, th something we haven't talked about yet is you had a unique challenge during this entire shoot, Tim, and had to do with you and your health. What, what happened to you right when this whole thing was just unfolding? Right when I was uh, auditioning for the film, I was going for some tests, and right when he gave me the role, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. So then he told us our, our shooting schedule, and that's the same time I found out what my chemo schedule was gonna be. So it coincided with each other, and, and a few phone calls later, uh, fortunately, Tim, Tim allowed me to stay on the project. I think I had every finger and toe and hair and eyes crossed yeah. <laughs> that he would, because this was just the role of a lifetime that I, that I wanted so bad. Can, to combine my two passions can, like that. Can you explain to us, though, what that would have been like for you to have this opportunity and be struck with this? How does that test your faith at that moment with God? Is it one of those moments of, like, how could you do this? Or was it, I, I surrender completely in trust? Or a mixture of both? Absolutely. Some days up, some days down. What was that like? It's, it's, I was, it was my early 20s. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't have the why me moment. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a long cry one night with my mom and she said, um, you wouldn't want this to happen to any of your siblings. And right then it changed my whole mindset to fight. Mm -hmm. And another thing with that is I had this movie to look forward to every single day. And I was doing something that I wanted to do for so long. So had I not had this movie, 
it might have made that chemo process a bit more mm. grueling and, and arduous, but um, I, I had this movie to look forward to. So I was living my dream while having this bump in the road. And, and I think, you know, everyone has their own bumps in the road and God forbid it's cancer, but mm -hmm. that was mine and, and you just gotta push forward. So what sort of things, did Tim, did you have to do to accommodate her chemo treatment? Well, I think the first thing was to, you know, talk to her dad, you know, about how serious it was. and. Um, you know, as, as Katie had mentioned uh, off screen, it, it was, you know, tell me what are, what are the long-term prospects? Are you gonna be okay? I mean, forget about the movie for just, you know, a few minutes, mm -hmm. you know, what's the diagnosis? And um, is this something that you, that you still wanna do? And it's okay if you don't. Knowing that we built kind of the whole team around her, hmm. you know, so it was hard. It was, a, it was a difficult decision for us. And I had a heart to heart with her father and I knew how important it was. We talked, she said, look, I, I'm a theater major that played basketball. This is what I want to do. This is what I'm called to do. I just want the opportunity. And um, I talked to her dad and her dad said, you know, this is her dream. And so I met with a couple of my producers and I said, you know, let's see if we can change our schedule to accommodate her so that it's not as grueling while she's going through chemo. And, uh, you know, we made those changes. And, um, you know, like anything else, it's just, it was a total team effort. Everybody bought into it. Everybody knew about her situation. We were afraid that she would start losing her hair during filming. So we started out, she wore a wig um, the entire time. And so you, could, you can't really tell, uh, but that was one of the, re the precautions that, that we took, right. um, but made it happen and glad that we did. And, um, you know, fulfilled the dream. Did you have days, Katie, where you just, you just physically were so exhausted, you couldn't, you just know if you could do it? and you had to really fight through that? Did you, did you draw back to those days on the court when you were competing? Uh, did you feel like you were running a marathon up a mountain or? Yeah, I, I don't wish chemo upon anyone, sure. my worst enemy, nothing. Um, but he scheduled it so I would have chemo on a Friday and have that whole weekend off to recover. Mm. The first two days are the worst and then I come back to set and Again, just be so happy that I'm there. Um, at one time I had a 4.30 call time and a four o'clock appointment for chemo. And I was like, I need to change my chemo appointment. <laughs> my mom's like, your priorities are <laughs> a little bit skewed right now. <laughs> However, I got to set and my, my, I overheard my mom talking to my dad and he was like, she, she told him she has color to her face. It's, it's almost like this movie did more than, hmm. than I think anyone really knows sure. for me. Just um, for hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for as far as the basketball scenes, I think I remember one day, b that same day, we filmed till 4.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. That day, it, was, it, was, it wasn't it was so much that the chemo was affecting me. It was just 4.30 in the morning. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it was just, a, I think, a long day for everyone. But he, he couldn't have worked better with my schedule and, you and doing that. You prayed to St. Therese, right? You and your family, and you had... Yeah, my mom chose chose her to to just kind of focus our prayers um, on during this whole process. And one day we came home to a dozen roses, as that's her symbol. And and to this day we don't know who they came from. All it said was "Stay strong, love Saint Teresa," and and I I, I admit it. <laughs> Tim told me not to you. say anything about it. <laughs> Tim said she needs some roses dug. I said I can yeah. take care of that for yeah. you. So me and my wife got together, sent them over. So. If you turned it over, it said dog on the back. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What were some of the other challenges of making this movie? Um, well, I just think any any time you make an independent film, it's just uh, you know it's an eight week fire drill where you're working, you know, 16, 18 hours a day. Um, and that's Your what background in economics. Yeah, I, I have my degree from the University of Pennsylvania in yeah. economics. So uh, there is no connective tissue between <laughs> what, what I studied and, and, and what I do for a living. Um, there is some now uh, as a producer. I think you you apply, um, you know, more of the um, finance aspect of it. But um, yeah, you know, I, I tell kids, I mean, it, I get so many emails every day. I have an idea, I want to be a screenwriter, I want to do this. Typically what I do is if somebody emails me with an idea, I'll say, okay, I need you to do a seven or 10 page treatment on what that idea is and send it to me when it's finished and I'll never hear from them again. So <laughs> it's like my first test. And then the second thing I tell them is, if you really want to be in you know, the entertainment industry, you got to move to LA. And they go, well, I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, well, that's what you need to do. 
And, and it's really more a test than anything else to see how legitimate they really want to make that commitment. Mm -hmm. Because I was one of those kids that drove across country that didn't know anybody um, and contacted so you, you the- you got out of college? Yeah, a couple years after, I worked as a stockbroker for a couple years and then, um, uh, and was working on radio on the weekends. And I said, that's really, I enjoy that more than I do Monday through Friday. I've always wanted to work in film. So drove across country, uh, my parents cried. 200 bucks in your wallet? Yeah, I was like the, I was the only kid, <laughs> the only one of 12 that left the parish. So it was uh, very upsetting for my parents. And, uh, you know, I, it's weird because I probably wouldn't want my own kid to do it. Yet I did it, and I, you know, for uh, a little while it was pretty painful for my parents, but um, they knew that I loved it, and I've always wanted to do it. Um, but I sometimes ask myself, you know, this was my first time directing. It took me, I've been in the business for 25 years, and would you wait that long to fulfill your dream? And I don't think a lot of kids would. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you just feel like there's other things. You know, I'm married, I have three kids, so I need to be the provider as well. And um, you know, and now you live in. I live in. I live in suburban Philadelphia, and we have an office in in Philly and one in L. A. Right. So, so after you're established, you don't have to live in L. A. Right? No, so, no. We yeah. uh, when we started our family, we moved back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, our next clip here is uh, on trust, and do you want to set that one up? Um, yeah. You know, I, I think thematically, as you go through this film, mm -hmm. you know, what we really try to do is to hit on certain things that are immortal you know and and for any team that has had that chemistry there's such a level of trust you know even like what Katie was saying about when that team even came back 40 years later you could see the bond the trust bond that they had and you know for Kathy Rush it was look we just need to trust one another and it, it seems so simple and yet it's not and that became really kind of her first speech to the team you know if we can't be honest with one another then we shouldn't leave this gymnasium right now. Mm -hmm. And so she starts with that, and that really becomes kind of the catalyst of her message to the kids. Okay, so we'll roll this clip now on trust. Who here likes to win? That is the only reason you should be here. Unless, of course, you're trying to avoid household chores. <laughs> if that's the case, we've already got two things in common. Jen, you know why teams win? Talent? If basketball were only about talent, it would be played one-on-one. -on -one. You like these girls, Jen? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Who here thinks that Jen's lipstick is a good color for her? Come on, anybody? And look at her. Cute girl, olive skin, beautiful smile. Colleen, care to comment? Trust. Trust is why teams win. And if you can't trust your teammate to tell you your lipstick is wrong, you can't trust your teammate to call it a backdoor screen. So I will ask again, who here thinks it's a bad color? Easy to fix. Watch each other's backs. All I'm saying. That's tough, huh? <laughs> Personal grooming there, uh, but. By the way, I think you both look great tonight the way you <laughs> presented. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, one thing. Uh, we're having you on the, the show now because it's out on DVD. Mm -hmm. Trying to encourage people to buy this film to support uh, good movies. Uh, can you make a pitch for that? Uh, why is that important? Well, I, look, I, this, this is my commercial. Yes, yeah, um, your commercial. <laughs> if we're going to make films that are G-rated and we're going to kind of stand up to the system and, and knowing how difficult the system is, then we need to support it. And, and not in a way, this is not a film that you go, okay, it's Catholic, I have to support it. We're not, this is not guilt from the podium. This is a film that received phenomenal reviews across the board Roger Ebert, from everybody right? and you know the Catholic media loved mm -hmm. it so we need to support that mm -hmm. we need to you know we need to vote with our dollars and we you know for, for us as filmmakers for us to continue to want to make films like this 
you know, we need to show that people will come and see them. And we've got to prove Hollywood wrong. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Because if we can make, if we can make you know, uh, really all we want to do is break even, right? That's always the first thing. Get every, all the investors their money back. They've been generous to us. And, um, and hopefully we can make more. And as we go, I'll just put this question to both of you. Uh, what would you tell a young person out there who wants to get in the movie business? Uh, what would be your advice, Katie? To have a passion. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been told as I entered this business not to have a plan B because it is a hard business. And I've been going at it for a few years. And, and you know, you try and just get as much work as you can while staying true to yourself. Mm -hmm. But, but it's, it's, if it's what you want to do, go after it. Mm -hmm. And I'll add to that because it happens a lot with, with me as well where you, where you get kids that ask that question. And I, I often tell them, I say, you gotta get in the game. Like what, I'll say, ask them, what are you doing now after school? Well, I work at Panera. It's like, okay, don't work at Panera. There's nothing at Panera that's gonna advance your career in film or television. You need to go to the local TV station, radio station, find out who's the local filmmaker, mm -hmm. and go there and work, even if it means making less. Mm -hmm. You have to get in the game, because inevitably what happens is, who's ever in charge is gonna look down the bench one day and go, you're in. Mm -hmm. And they can't do it when you're working at the mall. Right. right. And so that's, uh, that's really what I encourage people to do, and especially create that. Um, it's, it's much easier to get a job as an intern when you're in high school or college than be the guy that graduated from college that's looking for a job. Right. You know, there's just, you know, and so I encourage people to do those internships during high school and college. Get your, you know, your foot in the door. Um, our industry is like a track meet. There's different events. You know, screenwriters not, doesn't write novels and, right. you know, uh, actors are on screen or you're a director behind the camera. Um, and so you have to find out what you really want to do. Well, thanks so much for joining Thank us you. tonight. And we'll be really praying for the success. And uh, may our Heavenly Father shine his face upon you and give you his peace. And may God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We'll see you next week. Thanks for coming on.